very short yet powerful topic on how to manage your teams remotely. And as Emma said, I'll be presenting a different twist and a different approach to becoming great remote managers because it's going to be the new norm and more and more companies are adapting and adopting this process of remote teams. Thank you very much. Welcome again, everyone. My name is Haysam Alameen. I'm the CEO and founder of RPM Consultancy and Training. I've been in this business for quite a long time. My relationship with training started when I embarked uh, out of military academy uh, and decided to take a completely different twist. And I started working in the hospitality industry at the very age of 16, 17, and in university in Miami, Florida, I was working and studying at the same time. And within a few years, by the age of 23, I became one of the youngest general managers in Sheraton's history. Uh, now, the reason I'm saying that is because I had some amazing managers that I worked with, some fantastic mentors, and I've had my share of the horrible bosses as well, which also taught me something, it taught me how not to be. So on top of my career, at the age of 23, I was hired by a very well-known international Saudi businessman, and I worked with him as his business manager. I got to travel around the world, lived like a prince for two years, and met some incredible personalities, like um, Margaret Thatcher, Nelson Mandela, Michael Jackson, um, uh, Steve Jobs. They're all passed away, if you notice. It's not my fault. It has nothing to do with me. But um, people like Richard Branson, who I had the pleasure and an honor of being on board his yacht and had a lunch with him. And all of these people had something in common. They had incredible characteristics, which I will share with you in a bit. Uh, that was a great experience. After two years of that, went back to the US, got hired with a company called TNT, the logistics company. I was in charge of launching TNT's operations in Saudi. And then I was given the role of uh, the director of sales. With that, I went back to the US after my contract was finished. I got my second degree. I am a, I, I'm in a, into organizational behavior psychology. I, I wrote my first book and got hired with a company called Ford Motor Company. And uh, with Ford, I was sent to Dubai. I was given an executive position. And the last position that I held with them was the director of sales, of after sales for Middle East in North Africa. Um, in all of those positions, ladies and gentlemen, I was somehow in charge of the training capacity. And it was natural for me to transition into that. In 2001, I quit my corporate career and I became a full-time consultant and trainer. And in 2002, I established the company and now we deliver training worldwide. We've got uh, programs currently being delivered in the US, Europe, Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East. And today, I wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about how to manage your teams remotely. So I can see that we have a fair bit of amount of people here and um, the topic of managing remotely is a very popular one nowadays. Now, I'm gonna ask you a question, so please jump in and, and, and let me know why is it that we're in, interested in this topic and what are those challenges that have been presented to us while leading or managing remote teams? What are those challenges that we often face? Um, what are those difficulties? Can anyone please uh, jump in and, and say, hey, I think those challenges of managing remote teams are what? And I'm interested to see what people's perspective are. All right, uh, I've got a, a good friend of mine here. I think I recognize the name, Charles. How are you, Charles? Hope, uh, hope you are on board and online with us. So we're talking about, hey, what are those challenges that managers often find while managing teams remotely. Hello, Hello Charles. Uh, I'm available and awake. Um, the, uh, I guess the, the biggest thing is um, the the uh, difference in management style that is required um, from senior managers when they have their staff not under their their wings and in their sight. Um, for me, that's the biggest challenge. And yeah. I think people who are older managers and not 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 I'm not classifying people, but I'm old. Um, but I like to think I'm quite flexible and adaptable. Um, yeah. Don't necess but but conventional people don't always trust um, their staff if they don't see them all the time. Right. Uh, and instead of focusing on delivery. 
yeah. and realizing that people are actually adult and um, and trustworthy. Otherwise, they shouldn't be in your entity in the first place. Um, yes. They tend to want to still micromanage people when they're not in the office, and that for me is a is a huge potential problem, not only for managers but also for the staff. Amazing, so, amazing. Really Thank you, Charles. You, you've hit on a, on two very uh, very interesting points. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back to that, Charles. But I've got uh, W uh, U U, Mr. Sean Burgess. Uh, go ahead, please. I have your hands raised. If you can jump in and let me know what your perspective is. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I find. Oh, sorry. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I think the thing that I struggle with the most is is understanding and noticing the nuances of, of human behavior in the sense of when you speak to one of your team members for 15 minutes or half an hour a day, you you don't notice yeah. those things that you would notice if you spend the entire day in an office with them. You don't notice yeah. their, their behaviors changed or they're happy or they're sad. And I think that's something I really struggle with, with the separation. Right. Right. Yes, yes. And and that uh, that does cause a problem with with the engagement part of it. It's, we lose that sort of engagement, that uh, the human engagement, and, uh, and 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 it starts to affect the, the the culture of your team and and what they're used to. Thank you very much. Absolutely, that's definitely one of them. Um, there's many challenges, of course, uh, like Charles has said and 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 Sean have mentioned, is that. Um, there's the word trust, the word, the emotional nuances, being under one roof. And the reason why I'm saying that you guys nailed it on the head is because what has happened right now uh, with the COVID-19 situation, I call it the ultimate moment of truth. It has shed light on so many things, has created a lot of challenges, but at the same time has created a lot of opportunities and it's created the ultimate moment of truth for leaders and managers. What do you believe is that moment of truth is? And I think to build on what Charles said is trust. There has been a light that's been shed on leadership styles, management styles. Do I really trust you, Mark? Do I really trust you, Val? Rolando, do I really believe you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? because we're not under the same roof and I'm, you're not under my watchful eye, that's been an issue here, right? So the moment of truth is that there's a lot of leaders who were micromanagers, who did not trust people, who believed in total control, have lost the plot because we're not under the same roof, which is another word I mentioned earlier. We're not under the same roof. So I lost my control. I lost the control of the team, which a lot of um, traditional managers preferred. And that's a problem. So what do you think happens when traditional management styles that requires me to be my team under my watchful eye and the same roof, what do you think that moment of truth and that what happened right now with teams have been away or working remotely how do you think it affected the traditional style of managers? How do you think it, um, it, how do you think it made them further behave? How do you think, uh, did it magnify that behavior or did they lose the plot or lose control? How do you think it affected the traditional style of management, ladies and gentlemen? It magnified it. It means that now people who still use the traditional forms, who wanted, who had an issue with trust in their teams, have become grossly distrustful. And managers who wanted everybody under the roof, under the watchful eye, have become grossly micromanagers. It's crazy. It's because now we get things like people that I coach on a regular basis and say, hi, some, there's no more lines that have been drawn. My manager calls me at any time during the day. It seems like there's a direct line of communication. There's a carte blanche that we are constantly followed up on. So um, the moment of truth is another on the flip side that some, some people have really risen to the occasion being a team members or managers who have sent this incredible message through their 
management style that, hey, we're going to get through this together. We are connected. No one's off away from the mothership. And um, I trust you. I'm going to do my best to be uh, uh, emotionally attached to, uh, to you and to the uh, environment. So that's the ultimate moment of truth. And so we need to ask ourselves, what kind of management style are we using while people are away? Now, naturally, there's a lot of things we've heard with, with managing your teams remotely as checking in on a regular basis, double check they're okay, connect with them personally. All of these are, are great things to do uh, to keep everybody in the loop and so far and so on and so far. That's great. But when it comes to your management style, this twist that I'm going to give you today is that please stop managing and start coaching. Stop managing and start coaching. Now, we've heard that word a lot. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, we need to develop our coaching skills and, and making sure that uh, we use coaching skills to improve the performance of the team. We use coaching skills to make sure that our team members are, are even more engaged uh, and so, therefore, I'm always honing in on their skills and developing their skills and making sure that they, they perform at their ultimate and, uh, levels. But may I ask you a question here, ladies and gentlemen? Um, what, what is the difference between managing and coaching? And how can coaching replace managing? And I'm not saying that stop managing altogether, but especially when I'm managing my remote teams, the one skill that I need to hone in on, that I develop, is my coaching skills. To be able to be really a coach that inspires, motivates, develops, and guides their team, whether they are under the same roof or away, towards common objectives. So, ladies and gentlemen, what do you when you hear the word coaching, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What do you think your team's challenges are by being away from the office? and working remotely from home or from, from remote locations. What do you think those challenges are, guys? Hey, Sim, if I can say, it's probably the, Please. the lack of ability to, to interact with your, with your manager, um, uh, mm -hmm. and particularly from a mentor perspective. You know, when people are around and you, um, and you walk a couple of meters into someone's office um, to yeah. ask for yeah. assistance and... Uh, and that's one thing, when you are not in the same building, under the same roof, then it is more difficult. Um, people will tend to try and sort of solve their own problems instead of getting their mentor to, to help them um, exactly. solve them easier. So that whole training aspect um, of, of the situation becomes a very, um, I, I think, a big lack of uh, performance in many ways for for staff because they just don't have that interaction yeah. with them yes. between each other. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Charles. Very, very interesting. And, and, and that that level of interaction, the feeling of being away from the mothership, or the feeling of isolation, uh, those are things that could really destroy motivation, performance, and uh, and getting things done. Does anyone care to, to shed light uh, on that topic from a different perspective? Maybe from your own experience, what did you suffer from while you were working remotely? When you were away from the office during lockdown or, uh, you know, during um, at the times when we were, you know, confined to our homes, um, you know, the one thing that I suffered from is is visibility, I think. I think is not having everybody around and not only as a, as a manager, as a leader of my organization, but even is, to, is that a human interaction. And, and the one thing that I kept on getting a lot of is um, uh, there's a couple of schools of thoughts here with people working from home. Some people said, I loved it. I was extremely effective and very, very productive. And some people said, no, I was not. I preferred to work... Um, from the office. Um, you can only find this out is when you literally stop managing and start coaching. So let me revert back to my question. What do great coaches do? Uh, let's think about uh, if the sports of football or, uh, or any team sport. What is, the, what is the job of a coach? What do you think a coach does? I mean, in, in the sense of the word, a sports coach 
does what exactly? For those of you who are football lovers or sports lovers, what do you think the job of a coach is? So I would really welcome everyone's, uh, any, any view on, and there's no wrong answers, by the way. It's just that, what do you think the coach does, um, whether you're a sports fan or not? Or if you're too shy to speak up, you can always write it in the message box as well. Yes, absolutely, 100%. So if, if you get the message, then, then Emma can read the message and she can tell me if that's, if that's okay. Well, coach does what he, they focus on not only the entire team, but they focus on the individual. And they realize that each individual brings something different to the table. Each individual has something to offer. Now, a lot of people say, okay, so what do you mean, Heisen, by stop managing and start coaching? Is just try it out for a while. And if you're managing teams remotely, say, I'm going to go ahead and and manage my team's performance projects using a coaching approach. So, uh, number one, who do you manage on a weekly basis? That means who do you coach on a weekly basis? And that you say, hey, listen, Emma, we're going to have a session at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week. You need to, dis to, dis to decide who do you manage on a weekly basis, who you manage on a bi-weekly basis every month, or uh, and even every day. And that is very simple. It's the more you interact with your team, you understand that it has to do with performance. So high performers, self-starters, uh, company men and women, um, uh, people with a high level of commitment, they, you don't need to coach them on a weekly basis. Um, and underperformers, people who are lacking of motivation and not performing, then you need to increase the frequency of your coaching. And it could differ from person to person, company to company, department to department. But you need to make sure that, that you need to establish a clear coaching schedule well in advance. So that coaching schedule that's shared with your team members and no matter what happens, ladies and gentlemen, the one mistake that a lot of coaches would do is that they would not commit to that coaching schedule. Something comes up and say, hey, listen, Emma, listen, Charge, uh, um, let's go ahead and postpone our coaching session because something came up. Now, please, if you have to postpone your coaching session, it has to be for a very good reason. Because if you keep on postponing it and not using that as a primary tool to manage your team's performance, whether they are working at the, at the office or away, then you're sending the wrong message to them. They really don't care about their performance and you're just task driven. You're just focusing on what needs to be done on the projects, on the tasks and on the daily uh, activities. And that could be quite destructive. So I repeat, identify if you have five people or 10 people or 20 people, make sure that you have a coaching schedule that is in line with the level of performance, the level of commitment, the level of motivation. Even high performers, self-starters, the, the people who work quite effectively alone uh, need to be coached. And of course, between coaching sessions, it doesn't mean that you completely have this radio silence, but at least using the, the, the coaching model that I'm about to show you right now, um, you'll be able to really manage performance, manage expectations, and get people engaged. However, in between those coaching sessions, you can engage your team through uh, calls that to check in on them, um, create projects and tasks where it could drive the team to collaborate online, to create a team building environment, and to create a sense of collaboration, and to create this virtual uh, environment where everybody is connecting and working together towards a common goal. But uh, the one thing that got us through this is we applied this coaching uh, approach and within two or three months, our company went from completely a non-digital and non-transformed uh, organization where now we have created an entire uh, mechanism of 
the virtual uh, academy, the online self-learning academy. We created new content, videos, podcasts, and the team was super busy, super engaged. And to be honest with you, when I use this, uh, the process of coaching throughout the lockdown, I can honestly say it was one of the most productive periods in the company's history. And therefore, I continue to do that uh, long after the lockdowns stopped here in Dubai. And I highly recommend that you use this, whether you are managing your teams remotely or managing your teams within your organization. Please stop managing and start coaching. So having said that, this is a long introduction before I show you the tool. And, and so now you understand who to coach. You've got a coaching schedule. You know what coaching is all about. Um, and coaching is about asking powerful questions and structured powerful questions, which means that you have to have some incredible interpersonal communication skills. You have to be ready to use your helping skills, your mentoring skills, your teaching skills, even your challenging skills. So we'll go back. Of course, this is a completely different uh, topic here, but be ready to be able to communicate, to help, to mentor and to teach and to challenge. Um, and be ready to have this ability to praise sincerely during your coaching sessions, to understand what another job entails and uh, the ability to be trusted and to trust others. I think this is a great way for, for, for coaching sessions to be successful is to be to show that you trust them. And I'm going to show you, by the way, I'm going to, sh I'm going to share with you the structure of which you conduct this uh, coaching sessions effectively. The ability to be warm and friendly, the ability to relay honest concerns and uh, allow your team members and yourself to disagree on certain topics in order to get uh, to pave the way for their success, whether they're working remotely or within your organization. So every great leader, every great manager must um, master the skill of coaching. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, certifications out there where you can go and get certified to be a coach and all of that. That's great. If you can do that, fantastic. But I'm going to give you a model which I designed, which called uh, the GAINS coaching model. And, um, and it's going to simplify it. And if you, I repeat, if you use that as a way of managing your team by, by ensuring that you coach your team on a regular basis, you're going to see a complete transformation of your team and a quantum leap towards performance and towards results. So are we good so far? I'm going to go ahead and, and jump straight into the coaching model. And the way we set up the coaching model is people now know what their calendar is. They, they know what their time slot is, how much time you're going to spend time with them. And you need to let them know that that's our coaching uh, calendar from now on. If people are not familiar with, their, with what coaching means, you describe what coaching is all about. That this is a way to make sure that I uh, stay in regular touch with you, that I would talk about issues in, with regards to uh, challenges, to uh, goals, to ideas, to all of this stuff. So make sure that people understand coaching the right way because somebody said to me the other day, oh, if I'm being coached, does that mean that I'm not performing well, Haisam? And I say, on the contrary, it means that we want you to we want to improve your performance and continuously improve it. So make sure that people do not look at coaching as a form of um, of performance appraisal because it's not, and a performance review it is not. It is one way for you to ensure that your team is on top of their game and they're constantly performing, especially when they're away. So. The model that I created is called the GAINS model, and it's, it's a five-step model. One, the GAINS stands for goal, and then assessment, ideas, next steps, and support. Now, please, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be asking some questions, and, and I need to pick your brains a little bit. So feel free to jump in and feel free uh, to answer questions freely. There's no such thing as a wrong question. So number one is when you sit down with the... Uh, with your team member uh, or, or over the phone or a Zoom call and say, listen, uh, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. And when you ask these questions, make sure that you note down these answers verbatim. You cannot uh, translate the answer the way you heard them. They have to be written down exactly as they were said by your team member. So first one is, 
the first question you do, which is based on your goal element, is you ask them. Uh, ask them about their desired achievement. For example, like, what is it that you want to achieve this week or this month? Now, may I ask you a question with regards to asking questions about their desired achievements? Hey, Haysom, uh, or hey, Emma, what are your objectives right now? What are you focusing on? What control do you feel? What are the things you feel un, uh, in control of? And what challenges do you have? Let's start with the desired achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, when you ask somebody, hey, what is it that you want to achieve this month or this week? What do you think that question does? When you say, hey, listen, what would you like to achieve? This is desired achievements. It's not about, oh, what are you working on and what do you want to achieve with regards to your goals and your objectives. The reason why we need to ask this question here, guys, is because a lot of your team members want to overperform. A lot of your team members want to do more than they're expected, above and beyond objectives. And we ask them, say, what is it that you want to achieve? What do you want to desire to achieve? They might come and step up by being and show you something that they want to do above and beyond their, uh, their job role. Um, you allow them to have the opportunity to become, to, to participate more proactively. So you go ahead and note down these answers. At this stage, are you just answering, que asking questions, please? And then you ask, okay, so what are your objectives for this week? If they ask, if they answer the question correctly, and the answer is, a, is an alignment with your objectives and the organizational or the department objectives, that means they are on track. If they do not, and they say, well, my objective is to work on that, unfortunately, sometimes there is lack of alignment. Uh, instead of telling them, oh, wh why are you working on this and on that, basically say, help me understand how these objectives relate to our departmental objectives or the project objectives. So here, if you hear a, an answer that is not aligned to your objectives, resist the temptation of telling them, but put it, if you want to say anything to them, put it in a question format, because you constantly want to give the, the ability and the feeling that the person is in control of this discussion, but really you are in control of this uh, coaching discussion. So then you move on to, so what are you focusing on right now? Uh, so Charles, Emma, um, what are you focusing on right now? They say, well, I'm focusing on this, this, and that. If they answer that they're focusing on the right uh, tasks, on the right uh, uh, um, project initiatives, that means they're on the right track. If they are focusing on something else, that means they've been pulled away in a completely different direction. Again, you do the same thing. You say, hey, help me understand how this what you focus on right now relates back to our projects. So you keep on asking questions uh, so they can get to the answer. And I repeat, if you want to tell them something, ask them. The question that I ask is because, hey, tell me, what do you feel in control? Control is the opposite of stress. Uh, control lets me know that this is high sum, this is what I feel in control of, and I feel that I can really uh, perform best in these areas. I'm in control of this project, in control of this topic, in, in control of this specific uh, process, because it gives me the people uh, the ability to say, hey, I got this. This is where I can knock it out of the park. You know, note down the answers. And if they, um, if they say, well, I don't feel like I'm in control of anything, to be honest with you, that means there's a problem. So, okay, then you say, well, then what are your challenges at the moment? What are those difficulties you're facing? Tell me about some of the challenges, the difficulties. And be stubborn with your answers. Make sure that keep asking because some people are reluctant, especially when you do these coaching sessions for the first time. Some people might go, what the heck is going on here? This, I'm not used to this. Am I being uh, questioned? That's why you need to manage expectations at the beginning. So keep on being persistent in uncovering the challenges rather than just blowing over these questions. And when they share those challenges with you at this stage is you just note it down. You don't have to respond to anything at this stage, nothing at all. So then what you do before you're moving on to the second part of 
your uh, your coaching uh, session is you summarize the answers, make sure that this that you have gotten everything correct, and you say, right, let's move on now to the next set of questions, which is the assessment questions. This is when you ask the employee about their current situation. Hey, Emma, what are you involved in right now? What has been done so far? What results have you achieved? Now, this is to see whether they are really moving uh, 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 within their tasks and, and, and their, their objectives smoothly, that they are, um, they are aligned even more so, and to see whether delivering the result that they're supposed to be delivering on a weekly or a monthly basis. If they give you the right answers, great. That means they are on track. They are on top of things. If not, you tell them, you ask them the question here. You have to wait a little bit. Don't, uh, don't say, well, how come you're, why are you being so late? What you do here is, well, what can we do to make sure that you get things done on time and you get things done on, on, on schedule? Um, and uh, let's talk more about your results. So every time they answer something that is not aligned with timing and organization and scheduling, you just simply drill down till they get the answer and commit to it. Now, there's a question here that says showstoppers. A showstopper is a question that I make sure that I ask during every coaching session. Tell me about a wow moment. Wow. Something that you're proud of, something that's, a showstopper means something that they are, that they've done and they knocked it out of the park. And this is the ability for me to say, hey, great, well done, to acknowledge and to motivate them by saying, great, well done, I'd like to see more of that. That's fantastic, bravo, well done. And when you ask this question consistently, ladies and gentlemen, they make sure that by the next coaching session, they would want to share this, to share this wow moment with you. And it creates this momentum of your team members sharing these powerful moments where they've done a great job. And the last question is, is what, do you, what are your plans to move forward? How can we continue this momentum that you're on right now? And again, at this stage, you simply review the answers and uh, before you move on to the next session, which is the ideas. This is one of my favorite parts during the coaching session. This is when you pick your brains, uh, your, your, your team's brain. And this is when you start to address things. All right, so you spoke about these challenges, Emma. How do you plan to tackle these issues? No, I don't think we can argue with that. I don't think no manager knows all the answers. And if you think that you know all the answers, <laughs> I suggest that you reconsider your management style. So this is a great way to engage people and to give them a voice and to give them empowerment and you say, great, I love those ideas, fantastic. And quite frankly, every time I ask for my ideas from my team members, almost every time, I get an answer that I never thought of because I truly believe that the best people who own the problem often have the best solution, the best idea, most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. And if you have a better idea, let's say if the ideas that they have suggested to you have limitations for budget, uh, operational limitations, uh, um, policy limitations, and you say, that's great. And your response to that would be something like, uh, that's good. What if we, we, and the word here is we do this instead. What do you think of this idea? What do you think of the solution? Oh, that will work. Really? Yeah. How do you think we should do it? So now you move on to the next steps. So once they shared ideas, once to suggested ideas with them in a question format, you move on to say, great, so, so how do we plan to meet your goals for next week? And with regards to those challenges, how do we plan to overcome the challenges? And let's talk about the step-by-step -step approach of, 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 of overcoming those challenges. And what are you going to do today? What's the first priorities you're going to work on today? So the minute after this coaching session is done, um, what do we plan to do? So you make sure that they, when they leave here, that the reason why we ask a, a what to do today and the next step is to make sure that they are off in the right direction, that they have 
the steps, the procedures, the things they need to focus on, the priorities to over to meet their goals and to overcome some of the challenges and the ideas that they have and to implement those ideas that they have shared with you. Um, and you have no idea, guys, what what great engagement, uh, feeling of engagement that creates. You will uh, see a completely different um, type of of participation. It's incredible. And the last part of the coaching uh, session or the model is support. Now, I'd like to be a little bit pragmatic here is by, by, by saying, okay, which is, in my opinion, this is probably the, the icing on the cake. And I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by being pragmatic in just a few seconds. Uh, so you then ask what he or she expects from you. So Emma, great. What do you expect from me? in order for make, to make these things happen. How can I support you? What do you need from me? Who else can support you? And what is the best way you want this support to be given to you? And are you committed to proceed? Who else is committed to proceed? Based on these answers, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just lip service. When you ask how you can support your team, go out there and get it done. Be their, their advocate of facilitating things for them, not only within your department, but within other departments and other aspects and other areas of the business. And commit, make commitments on how you're going to support them. Make commitments on how you're going to stand by them. Make commitments on how you're going to facilitate their success, facilitate them then getting to those objectives and getting to those targets and make sure that you also, if there's, if you, if you basically have a some sort of inclination that there's a bit of conflict, like for example, I would ask, let's say uh, Charles and Emma work for me, and Haysom, I'm, I'm boss X, so Haysom and Emma and Charles work for me, and I say, hey, at the end of the session, so Emma, who's who's committed to proceed? Emma goes, I think Haysom. Uh, uh, and, and, and Charles is committed to, uh, 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 Haysom is committed to proceed. She didn't mention Charles, so I'm just going to keep it at that. Because I'm not going to say, how come Charles, why, why didn't you mention Charles? I'm going to open up the, 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 the window here or the opportunity that this coaching session might come into a conflict resolution session. So don't say anything. Say, okay, so I just noted that uh, Haysom is permitted to proceed. Now I sit down with Charles, and at the end of my coaching session, I say, hey, Charles, who's committed to proceed? Charles is going to say, uh, Emma, hi, uh, or uh, uh, Emma is committed to proceed. So it means that if any of your team members do not mention another team player, it could mean that there's an issue with this team player. So if you know that there is an issue with conflict and misalignment, address these misalignment and conflict in another session, which is a conflict resolution session. But please, please do not address any conflict, conflict, team conflict. You can address challenges, ask about difficulties. But when it comes to conflict specifically, note that down and make sure that you sit down and have a conflict resolution session. And of course, as usual, there are a process, there's a process of conducting an effective conflict resolution session if there's any conflict between your teams. But the coaching session should be focused on performance, personal performance, motivation, goals, objectives, and facilitating the way and pave the way for facilitating your team for higher performance especially when they are away. So um, once you complete this entire coaching session, you say, thank you very much. This has been an amazing session. Here's a copy. I'm going to send you a copy of your coaching notes. I'm going to keep a copy. And I'll see you next week at 3 o'clock Thursday, four, or 3 o'clock Thursday for our next coaching session. So what you do is you remind them of the upcoming coaching sessions. And you tell them that, great, our next coaching session, I'm going to go ahead and go through these things again, and then you repeat the same questioning process all over again. 
So consistency here in using these questions from one coaching session to another is what allows your team to stay consistent, motivated, engaged, and highly motivated, especially when they're away. Now, there's a little, um, a little, uh, uh, maybe a couple of things that I want you to to uh, pay attention to. For those managers who have never done this before, and for those team members who are not accustomed to this, they're gonna look at you and say, what the heck's going on here? This is really strange. We've, we've been working with this manager for, for a long time now. This is unusual. Do not expect great results from the first or the second coaching session. In fact, Great results, and when you they, when your team members see you that you are consistently adhering and committed to the coaching schedule and to the coaching process, you're gonna see some great re- re- results after the after the third or the fourth coaching session. And if that becomes part of your management style, you know that becomes part of your management uh, persona, and where you stop managing and start coaching. Because really, if you think about it, you can include all of your projects, objectives build them in within the coaching session and which means that by the end of the coaching session you have a a commitment plan if you really think about it the outcomes of the entire coaching session is actually a commitment plan of two people your team members commitment plan and your commitment to support them and that would be the best management tool that will avoid you from micromanaging people uh constant follow-ups um and total chaos of following up on people when they're away. And that creates clarity, direction, and manages expectations of all parties involved. So that's the, before I move, before I end and I conclude today, this is my recommendation. That's my suggestion. That please, ladies and gentlemen, while managing your teams remotely, stop managing and start coaching. I'm happy to take any feedback, any comments, any questions with regards to the model. Don't worry. What we're going to do is I think uh, Emma is going to make an announcement of uh, what you're going to receive after the the session. I'm definitely, we're going to share with you the content. We're going to share you some additional reading material. And uh, there's going to be a surprise for everybody as well. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing here so I can see everybody uh, Charles, go ahead. I think, Charles, you had your hands raised. Please go ahead. Thanks, Aysim. Yes, I have a question about um, leadership generally. You know, I'm a big believer and always have been a believer of participative management. Um, in other words, that the leader is not necessarily the guy on the biggest horse with the biggest sword, you know, running, riding up front and, uh, and blazing trails, but really working behind the scenes almost bringing out the best in every person and and focusing on their strengths and and ensuring that that is the biggest contribution that they make how do you through this training process particularly now when you're not seeing people all the time um ensure that the that that one can engage people on a on a on a level where everyone is participating in this whole training process because it's not only a one-on-one session it is actually a group a group effort that needs to be had in order to achieve the organization's objectives um how, how do you subtly communicate that within these coaching sessions where you are not really face to face with people yes so you're talking about communicating uh organizational objectives and stuff like that is that what you're talking about or communicating, um, what, what, I mean, what, I, I, if you help me understand the question a little bit, how do you communicate uh, expectations or what is it exactly? I, 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 yes, I, it's I, hard. hard. Yeah, with, with, within the, the sort of subtleties of leadership, yeah. um, in these coaching sessions, how do you communicate that in a, in a, um, yeah, in a subtle way, you know, bringing yeah. out, Drawing out the best of people, okay. without being in okay. their faces. If that makes sense. Great. Uh, let me. And thank you very much. It's a very good question, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to ask you something. If if I ask you that one question, what is what are the characteristics of great managers and leaders? 
What would you say they are? What do great leaders and managers do? Just to, you know, it's a general question. Come on, guys, let me hear from you. Rolando, I have here, Viducci, Mark, Sean. Sean, your name is very familiar. Sean Burgess, as if I know you somehow. I don't know why that name is so familiar. Uh, Carl, Carl Chua. I have one of my best friends. His name is uh, Chua, Dr. Chua in the U.S. Wow. So, yes. Can anyone tell me what is the, yes, go ahead, please. What are the characteristics of great leaders and managers? I hope you've worked with some of them. Come on, guys. So, if you really think about it, great managers are managing. Yes. Who's you, who's you, you? Sonia wants to speak. All right, go ahead, please. Sonia, yes. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, Hi, Sonia. for me, yeah, um, for me is a um, great leader is what you have mentioned is a great co coaching, <clears throat> which more on um, to guide the performance driven of each member. And right. also um, to improve the professionalism of each individual and the team. And it's taking more on um, holistic approach to the career of each member. So mm -hmm. that is the, the good leader and a good coaching for me. Wow, thank you very much. Absolutely, Sonia. Uh, you, 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 I'm going to buy you an ice cream. How about that? That's one thing I would want to buy. Absolutely. Guys, uh, uh, listen to this. I know we don't have much time. I can talk about this topic all day and all night because I love this topic. If you read uh, one of John Maxwell's um, books, he talks about the, the different levels of leadership, you know, the five levels of leadership. And he said that level one, people's, people follow you. And I'm going to come back to your question, uh, Charles, because I'm, I have not forgotten. People follow you because of your position. Because they have to. It's what's written on their business, on your business card. Uh, but you know what? A lot of managers are stuck there. They're stuck there because they're the manager. They, they tell people what to do because they are the position sensor. So we need to evolve to the next level is permission. People follow you because they want to, not because they have to. Because they see something in you that they like. They see something that they can relate to. That's a great one. But being likable... Oh, I have a nice manager. Emma is great. Charles is a really nice, kind manager. It's not enough. You need to rise to the third level, which is um, uh, what you have done for the organization is about production. Oh, they say, oh, hold on a second. Wow. Um, I want to follow this manager because they know their stuff. They are competent and they have a, a track record that I can benefit from. And of course, while keeping into consideration that you are a, a leader of permission and of, of per, uh, uh, position, permission and production. Uh, but you don't stop at that because if you're only a productive manager, that means you only are focused on what you want to produce. So you evolve to the fourth level of, of, of leadership, which people follow you for what you have done for them personally. And this goes to back to Sonia. People follow you because, hey, uh, my manager taught me a new skill. My manager really mentored me. My manager made me a better person. I love this manager. People development. The ultimate level of leadership, and maybe the, I'll ask you a question here, is what you have, what you stand for is the pinnacle of, of leadership. What are those principles and values you stand for? So here to ask your question is, as you can build all of this through your coaching session, you can do all of this. You can develop people. You can show how nice you are and how caring you are. You can display your knowledge and you can display your uh, abilities. And what better way to do so than to coach someone to do becoming a better person that you are going to create and one of the words that I love is be the leader of leaders. That means you're going to learn, you're going to teach people how to do things, you're going to coach them how to become better, and then you're going to display also your qualities as a leader. What do you stand for? Are you kind? Are you demanding? 
Are you tough or are you understanding? So in your style of delivering this, these messages, you can easily build in all of these things. It's a very malleable tool to let your people know that, hey, I'm doing this to support you, to coach you, to mentor you, and to make sure that I'm constantly uh, in contact with you. Because to be honest with you, to add on Sonia's, uh, on Sonia's description, the best leaders are the ones who are visible, who are always there, who listen, who understand, who empathize, and who have a, 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 a bird's eye view of what's happening in their organization. Because when you listen from your team members individually, you start to understand what's happening collectively. And then you have an incredible finger on, your, on the pulse of your organization you always have your ear to the ground and you always understand what's really going on. And to be honest with you, great coaches or great leaders who master coaching are actually incredible agile leaders. And agility right now is one of the biggest buzzwords, especially in today's world of what's happening right now is one of the elements, one of the three elements of agility is one is leading high performance teams by making sure that you uh, uh, use effective leadership skills and team building skills. The second element is uh, pivotal coaching conversations, pivotal conversations. And these are the conversations that are built on a coaching methodology that allows you to understand, I know what's happening in the front line. I know what's happening in the middle. So let's go ahead and pivot. Let's go ahead and make this uh, the decision to change directions very, very quickly. And you cannot pivot quickly because your team is like one big ship takes a lot of effort to push to move a few inches. But if you want to have a speedboat that pivots back and left and right quickly, you engage the team with your pivotal coaching conversations. And the third one is the ability to identify and manage change. And what better way to do so than being an incredible coach, having your fingers on the, uh, the, um, the pulse of your organization, understanding what needs to be done today and engaging uh, your entire teams through a coaching model that gets you where you want to get in a quantum leap. That's the best way to really lead high-performing agile teams. And it gives you the opportunity to become an agile leader. So it's all about not what you deliver and how, what you ask, but it's about how you ask and how you get to that uh, collective uh, um, participation by making sure that you are coached to each of those team members that you manage. Okay, okay, so thanks very much. Unless anybody's got any more questions now, which we're nearly out of time. I know yes. you've had a really long day. Your last session, I think you've been busy delivering all day when we caught you at the tail yes. end. So, um, and I knew we'd get a lot of enthusiasm and passion on this topic from you, which I think everybody could feel. Um, and for, for them to have something useful to use in their roles as well is yes. is very special so I know a lot of a lot of people often get told about you know utilizing coaching using coaching but to have yes. a practical tool they can use and apply is is very beneficial um, so I will share I will, I will share that with everybody when I send an email out later to those yes. who have attended also yes. more information about what Haysom does um, you know, I've I've, uh, I've been been uh, been part of a lot of the things that Haysom has delivered, and he always manages to keep me interested, even though my attention span is not great. And you <laughs> succeeded in that one today as well. Thank um, you so much. So thank you, everybody who attended, and thank you, Haysom, for your time. I've um, got I've got one more one more surprise. I think besides the the, 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 the tools and the information we're going to send them, uh, I'm, I'd like to send everybody a free copy of the latest book that I published. So you'll be receiving, everybody will be receiving a copy of my book and you will also receive some information about, I'm publishing a couple of more books, one of them called The Ultimate Guide for Today's Modern Leaders. You'll be, uh, you'll be informed when this is out. And also, I'd like to extend, Emma, if you don't mind, uh, anyone who's attended today, the opportunity to book a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me free of charge. So if you can share my details, they can reach out to me and book a Zoom session, one-on-one, -on -one, free of charge. And I'll be more than happy to schedule it at an equally 
Um, okay. so, that's, all right. that's great. I didn't even know that. I didn't know about the freebies added on the end there. So <laughs> thanks, Hasem. That sounds awesome. Um, so yeah, we'll send out your details, and people can always channel it through me anyway. So yeah, all right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, take care. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Hasem. Bye bye.